Welcome to another edition of The Property Show, bringing investment opportunities, changing the landscape. Home ownership has become fashionable, with a few dishonest people taking advantage and selling ghost houses to gullible would-be homeowners. Catch legal advice on that interesting topic on our expert segment. If someone tells you they have a house, but for example, that they're selling, that they'd like to sell to you, you should first ask them to take you to the house so that you see the house. If it's a piece of land, you also need to see the piece of land. This show has everything from a collection of new neighborhoods ideal for investments on the property peak of the week. Convenient outdoor solutions on the accessory spot, Safari com fast internet connectivity, Kenya power on vandalism to a home ownership journey inspired by adventure, and finally, a conversation on student accommodation, popularly known as hostels. If you're looking to be inspired and expand your horizon on matters real estate, then sit back and relax because this is your show. Remember, there is something for everyone. The property pick of the week brings a collection of ideal investments available in the market. We kick off with Sheshe Gardens, offering stylish living experience designed in a country setting. Let's take a peek. Sheshe Gardens is a gated community located in Mulalongo in a serene environment with natural beauty. The development comprises of 10 blocks of 10 units of two bedroom and three bedroom apartments spread spaciously over five acres. The two bedroom apartment has a plinth area of 91.7 square meters. The three bedroom apartment has plinth area of 143 square meters. Salient features include for the three-bedroom apartment, spacious lounge with balcony, separate dining area, kitchen with granite countertops with fitted hardwood cupboards, dobe area, highly finished tile floors, master bedroom ensuite with a vanity area, separate bathroom and cloakroom, including guest cloakroom, inbuilt wardrobes, internet and cable connectivity, perimeter wall and 24-hour security, carbro driveways, and parking for tenants and visitors. Up next, the charming Malibu Court, located in Madaraka Estate. This project is close to social, recreational and shopping centers. It is an ideal family home, as well as a sound investment. Let's watch more. Malibu Court Apartments is a development consisting of 56 three-bedroom units. It is located in Nairobi's Madaraka Estate. Accommodation includes lounge opening to the balcony, dining, fitted American-type kitchen, kitchen yard, study, three bedrooms with the master ensuite, and common cloakroom. Salient features include bowhole, three high-speed lifts, three basement parkings, swimming pool, gym, cabra paved parking, guardhouse with intercom and CCTV. Now we are off to Caribou Homes, dedicated to providing affordable, well-constructed homes in a thriving community. Let me say that phase one and two is fully sold. Caribou Homes has recently broken ground for their phase three and off-plan sales are ongoing. You too can secure a unit.
Ariba Homes, located in Earth River Town, is a development dedicated to providing hardworking families with affordable, well-constructed homes in thriving communities. Karibu homes have both standard and superior living options. The Athi homes have standard finishes with common features including open plan living room and dining area, steel casement windows and brass curtain fittings, kitchen with inbuilt cupboards and an adjacent utility area with Dolby sink, master bedroom ensuite and other bedrooms share a tiled bathroom, built-in wardrobes and enhanced finishes. The Tana homes have superior finishes with common features such as attractive open plan living and dining room, kitchen and utility area, ceramic tile floors, steel casement windows and master bedroom ensuite, separate shared tiled bathroom and shower, built-in wardrobes and enhanced finishes. Next, a rare gem tucked away along Mombasa Road, Shaba Village. This mixed development of modern maisonettes and apartments is an ideal dream home and are sold with individual title deeds. Unbelievable. Let's have a look. Shaba Village is a comprehensive gated housing development comprising 50 units of three and four bedroom masonettes, each with servants quarter. The development also has four blocks of apartments comprising of two and three bedroom units. The development is suitable for homeowners who wish to secure a peaceful home environment as well as investors who wish to invest in real estate with good rental income. Shaba Village, your perfect modern family home integrated with nature. Accommodation includes spacious lounge with a dining area, fitted American style open plan kitchen and Dolby area, large windows, mahogany doors, well spaced staircase, wrought iron curtain rods, gypsum ceiling with cornices, high ceilings, high quality finishes, master bedroom ensuite with a balcony, two cozy bedrooms with a shared washroom, and visitor's cloakroom. Finally, an affordable masterpiece in the making, providing modern luxury, a money rich, which comes with elegant designs, open plan kitchen, huge windows, and generous balconies. This project is also being sold off plan. Book your unit and enjoy good discounts. Amani Ridge is an impeccable modern development in a desirable prime location of Siokimau with a master layout plan to give you that easy and luxurious living. These apartments are setting new standards for the middle classes while offering the best in class amenities with its excellent spacing and beautiful architectural design. Amani Ridge lies in a 1,365 square feet area with spacious three bedroom apartments plus ADSQ. Accommodation includes generously sized living area, spacious dining room, open plan kitchen, floor to ceiling cupboards, huge windows and a balcony, and all bedrooms are en suite. Salient features include high perimeter wall, electric fencing, 24 hour security, ample parking space, borehole, backup power generator, and Cabra paved walkways. At First Avenue, we hold your hand every step of the way, making the process of home ownership seamless. If you're looking to get onto the property ladder, 
call on us or just visit our offices and we'll be delighted to guide you. Scarcity of housing coupled with the fact that home ownership has become fashionable has seen a few dishonest people seek to take advantage of Kenyans. Our question today is what should Kenyans do differently? To take us through this sensitive subject we speak to Esther, a seasoned lawyer, on what we need to look out for before committing to purchase property. Karibu sana on the show. Thank you Nancy. As a Kenyan seeking to buy property, what should I know before I pay for it? Okay. The first thing you need to know or even do is to see the property. If someone tells you they have a house, but for example, that they are selling, that they like to sell to you, you should first ask them to take you to the house so that you see the house. If it's a piece of land, you also need to see the piece of land. Post seeing the piece of land or the house and having confirmed that indeed you like it, the second thing you need to do is ask who the owner is and if possible, meet the owner of the property. Now, thirdly, you need to conduct what we call due diligence on the property. Now, what is due diligence? Due diligence comprises of various parts. The first one is a title search. The title search is done at the Ministry of Lands, which is a custodian of all land records in, in Kenya. So when you do a title search, it tells you who the registered owner is, whether the property is, is free of any encumbrances, whether the property is fit for purpose. What this means is that if it's a house, then the, the permitted use should be a residential use. If you're buying an office, then the permitted use should be commercial use. If you're buying a hotel, then the permitted use should be a hotel. So you, you check to see that it is fit for purpose. Now beyond the title search, you then do what we call a correspondence search. Now a correspondence search is one that uh, traces the route of ownership of that property. And why this is important is that if for any reason that land was at, at some point, say public land, a correspondence search or the historical search will tell you uh, all of that, in which case then you avoid purchasing such a property. But where you find that uh, a property was properly allocated to a private person and uh, the ownership has passed from one person to the next, then, then that, that's a good property to buy. Now beyond the historical search, the next thing you do is to conduct what we call survey due diligence. Now what survey due diligence does is that it, it makes a connection between the property number and the survey records. And the survey records then point to the location of the property. Yeah, Because I could come to you and you tell me you're selling property A, and property A is land reference number one, but when I go to survey records, the number and the property on the ground do not correspond. So the survey due diligence enables you to determine whether indeed that property number you've been given corresponds with the, the property on the ground. Now, once you're done with the survey due diligence, then you need to do a due diligence on the seller. Yes. Now, where the seller is a company, you then go to the company's registry and uh, seek to find out, okay, so who's this company, who are the shareholders, who are the directors? And if indeed you find that the directors are some of the people you're dealing with in the conversation of the sale, then, then you're on the right track. If it's a human person, get a copy of their ID, go to the registry of persons and conduct a, a search just, just to confirm that the copy of the ID you have corresponds with what you have at the company's registry. Now with all of that work, you will indeed be in a good place to proceed. In the recent past, Kenyans have been conned buying property without proper documentation. What should they have done differently? Um, I think really it's to engage professionals because if the person who's selling the property to you, for example, is an estate agent, are they people of repute here? Yeah? Are they people who have been in the business and who've been known to conduct a truthful business? Then secondly, you would need to engage a lawyer. Yeah, The lawyer is the person who's best place to conduct the due diligence for you, uh, starting from the title search, the historical search, and even the search on the seller. Um, the other thing you perhaps ought to do so that then you determine whether indeed the property you're buying is, 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 is value for the money that you're going to pay is the valuation of the property. Yeah, so uh, look for a valuer 
who will then go to the property and look at it, whether it is land or building. They will look at it and then determine whether the price at which the property is offered to you is indeed a good a good price. Now when you have three sets of professionals looking at this property before you touch it, then uh, if there's something wrong, well, at least one of them will spot it. There you've had it from the expert. When it comes to buying property, the first step is to take your time before signing the dotted line. Work with professionals and you must do a due diligence. Coming up, the big box and how it works. They say everything else is just TV, but the big box is TV and internet. Let's hear more. Don't wait to join Safaricom 4G. On 4G, you get faster sharing, crystal clear videos, non-stop music, video calls, and more. To be on Safaricom 4G, all you need is a 4G SIM and a 4G phone. As many people would ask, why do you call it the big box? And we can see it's just a small device. This box has a room of entertainment. It gives over 200 free-to-air channels, most local channels. And the major entertainment is the 4G, fast internet high-speed connection for the home use, that is the internet, Wi-Fi, up to 10 users. Also, it's an Android-enabled device. When you buy the setup box, it has a manual that can guide you through. And also, like any other phone, it's very easy. Nowadays, we don't use manual in the phone. It just connects automatically. Another additional feature, it's remote. It's also a cursor enable and a keyboard enable. So you can just press menu. These are the guides. There's an installed manual guide you can read through. There's internet. What makes it big also, it can make any model of TV from Great Wall to Plasma Inch TV to become an internet enabled TV that is a smart TV. We have application, like I said, it's an Android enabled. So we have apps. It, it comes with YouTube installed already. And there is a setting whereby you go through the settings, you can connect to the hotspot for you and your family to enjoy the, the hotspot. For the lovers of music and all entertainment, it gives crystal clear videos and non-stop music. You can download any music, any format, all genre, using the big box, the room for all entertainment. So don't wait, do things faster with 4G. When the Safaricom goes further and they brought 4Gs, they overpower some of the networks because of the 4G, which is faster and efficient in service. To find out if your phone is 4G enabled, Go to your device settings, look for the 4G or the LTE option under the network settings. Select this option to activate Safaricom 4G. To find out if you have a 4G SIM, dial star 544 hash and select Safaricom 4G bundles and SIM check. You'll be notified if your SIM card is 4G capable. If you don't have a Safaricom 4G SIM or a 4G phone, don't wait. Visit the Safaricom shop closest to you. You will find a wide variety of 4G enabled phones and devices to choose from. You can also swap your old SIM for a 4G SIM for free. Don't wait to join Safaricom 4G. Next, if you're looking for out 
outdoor solution, look no further. Find it right here on the Accessory Sports. Proceed actually started in 2003 in Uganda. I then moved here um, in 2014 and we started Proceed Kenya. And immediately we started working on this project where we are at the Probistro rooftop in Westlands. And since then we've been doing a numerous number of projects, not only in Nairobi, but in uh, a few other countries in Africa. We also do car shades and we do fabric structures, which is sort of like shade sails uh, to tensile membrane structures, to outdoor screens, umbrellas. First and foremost, we will ask for, you know, um, exactly what you need. And usually the client is not very sure. So we actually just ask if we can visit the site. And when we visit the site, we'll just take measurements. And then we'll go back to the drawing board and start making drawings, uh, different options, and we come up with the renders, what are the different options that we can provide. And then from there, we move on to costing and then approval and, you know, then the job gets on. We've got a three week manufacturing period that we need first. Then we've got to consider shipping times, um, clearance and whatnot. Installation usually is about two, three, four days, yeah. And then that's it, and then the project is done. So within a period of roughly two, three months, you've got your structure fully ready. All our structures, all our roofs are 100% watertight. We've got gutters, we've got a well-managed water system. Everything works very perfectly for all weather solutions. We do offer um, maintenance services. We have maintenance contracts with our clients. We do maintenance of just once a year. We feel once a year is just good enough, whereby we just do general cleaning, um, just checking if everything is working properly. If all the motors and the lights and everything are just working just the way uh, when we first installed. Our retractable roofs really add a lot of value to any property given, any property. And for commercial spaces, it's a very good return on investment commercial places such as this which is a restaurant very good return on investment i know for example Brabistro have saved a lot of money on these gas warmers uh, so during the night they close the whole roof and it becomes warm in here and they don't need to spend money on the gas bottles anymore and for homeowners just the roof being there will add at least 10 percent just to the value of your house yeah and you know Let's assume now you're a property agent, you have a buyer, you're coming to show the buyer the house and he just sees the roof and he gets that remote and he operates to move the roof and he sees it moving. You, you can bring your, your, your selling papers right there and then because it just brings about this wow factor. It's not a normal thing to see having a roof moving, you know, and it's that added value that I'm talking about. Yes. So the roofs need electricity to work. And in the event that there's no electricity, what you can have is an inverter. Like here at Brabistro, I know they have a power inverter, which is able to save a bit of that energy for the time when there is no power. And the roofs are able to still work. Should it start raining, at least you're guaranteed, even when there's no power, your roofs will still move and they'll still work. So you don't have to worry about that. So depending on uh, how long your roof is, the size of your roof, uh, roughly maximum two minutes is how long it will take for your roof to come down. If you have a small roof, it will take 30 seconds or a minute. Yeah. When you operate the buttons on the remotes, we have different functions for whether it's intensity or speed or strength that you need. Yeah. building a dream home or looking to renovate at first avenue we work with professionals across the value chain and would be happy to connect you
Still to come after the break, a highlight on student accommodation, popularly known as hostels, plus a home ownership journey inspired by adventure. Don't go away. Welcome back. You're watching The Property Show. Often power cuts are caused by transformer vandalism. Let's catch up with Kenya Power on their initiatives to protect power lines. Over time, of course, we've faced challenges as a department in terms of uh, threats to our material resource. And uh, what concerns us the most is what costs the company a lot. That is vandalism of uh, our transmission and distribution equipment. One thing I want to dwell about today is the uh, issue of vandalism of transformers and conductors, which is a uh, major distribution uh, materials. Uh, vandalism of our transformers entails uh, bringing down a transformer which is in our network by vandals, isolate it and bold it, remove uh, the copper windings inside our transformer and the oil as well for sale in the black market. Uh, a kilo of uh, copper costs about between 700 and 1000 shillings in the black market, so to one liter of uh, transformer oil. What makes these people vandalize these um, items, uh, number one, is because there is high demand for copper internationally, in, uh, in the international market. So when they vandalize, they get ready market for them to dispose them and get ready uh, income. There is also the multiple uses of uh, oil, for example. We've had uh, theories that most of them are used to cook chips uh, in the streets. They are used also to mix with other lubricants, to be used in vehicles, to be used in other sectors like um, coolant in welding machines. And that is some of the things that causes these people to, to vandalize our transformers. The consequences of uh, vandalism, I'll start to the impact to us as Kenya Power. Number one, um, it hinders our attainment of our connectivity targets. Because if you remove a transformer which serves like 10 customers, or, uh, because a transformer serves an average of 50 to 100 customers, depending of course on consumption, you will have hindered us from actually connecting more customers because we rely on a transformer to connect more customers. So our connectivity targets will be hampered. Number two, it leads to outages. I've mentioned about this number of customers who will be out of supply for some time. So outages actually affects us in terms of revenue because we will not be able to get revenue for that. Number three, the aspect of replacement. It costs the company a lot of money to replace a transformer. And of course, number four, it leaves bad taste in terms of customers not being satisfied and that we are not supplying them with uh, you know, a regular supply of power. And of course, uh, transformers that serve streetlights, for example, will you know, have a security consequence because number one, if the area is dark, it's uh, a recipe for other criminal activities. Several costs uh, cost to it. Number one, the, the cost of buying a new transformer to replace and the cost of cost of labor uh, to return that transformer uh, back to the network. I'll give you a rough estimate in terms of the figures for the last uh, five financial years. Um, in 2012-2013, the cost of transformers which were vandalized in the company cost us around 376 million. That is the year we lost around 813 transformers. The coming year we lost uh, around 535 transformers, uh, which cost us around 184 million Kenyan shillings. Of course, 2014-2015, we had uh, enhanced he efforts that led to a reduction of a uh, number of vandalized transformers up to 268 transformers, which actually costed us around 100 million. In 2015-2016, we dropped again down to 221 transformers, which costed us around 86 million. 
and uh, this financial year uh, to date we have launched around 66 transformers which has actually costed the company around 8 million in those five years that costed us around 755 million which we lost around uh, 933 transformers Next week, we continue with this topic. Last week, we started a conversation on student accommodation, popularly known as hostels. We have received many questions on this topic. Is student accommodation a good investment? What do students look for? And where are the hotspots one should consider? First, with the expansion of public and private universities, as well as colleges, the region has not been matched by the supply of affordable and comfortable accommodation. Secondly, the region has an annual shortage of a staggering 350,000 beds, and yet accommodation is the number one most significant part of the university experience. Thirdly, students make accommodation choices based on location, cost, and social aspects. Finally, landlords should be cognizant of high returns come with a higher workload. Given that most students will be renting for the first time in their lives and may not fully understand their responsibilities, it is prudent to seek guarantees from their parents or guardians. to visit student accommodation around Rongai, Langata, and Athi River. We also noted most of these hostels provide transport. We kick off with elite hostels located in Rongai, a paradise away from home. Let's take a peek. hostel for three years now. Yeah. The reason why I've stayed here for quite a while is because of the serenity of the place. Uh, it's comfortable, it's a quiet place. At the hostel they provide for us food, food meaning breakfast and supper. And on weekends they give us lunch. There's transport. The Wi-Fi is fast, it works well, especially for us students. It's convenient because you can restart your work, do your assignments, and then the TV is convenient, the DSTV is paid for, the security is good, the guards are always here. Anytime you come, they open for you, and we've not had any issues with insecurity or such stuff. When you leave your room, your things are secured and all that stuff. Stop takes us to Langata, the Stone House Hostels, a true slice of home. Let's have a look. Stone House Hostel, I would describe it like a home away from home. Our target market is the university students, specifically in Jomo Kenyatta University Karen and Catholic University. We offer affordable accommodation for students who are admitted in universities in Nairobi, but they can't, for one reason or another, they are not able to commute from home. So 
Stone House becomes the home they come to when they're not at home. We give accommodation, that includes beddings. We clean up their rooms, we tidy up their rooms, and we give them meals, which is breakfast and dinner, because during lunchtime they are not here, they're in school. But weekends and public holiday, we provide lunch for those who are around, because most of them tend to go home. Over and above that, we, we have a, a courtesy bus that picks them in the morning, takes them to Karen, and in the evening picks them from Karen and brings them here. Then we do the usual, we ensure they have entertainment like Wi-Fi, they have swimming, they have table tennis and a pool table, yeah. Langata Road, as you all know, has some jam. But since we go against the traffic, we take about 10 to 15 minutes to get to Karen. And when there's no traffic, even five minutes. If we don't have like a time when they close, because every student nowadays is personalized. You'll find even, it's not the basic, the way we used to do April, August, and December. Other than, they take short breaks. Each student takes maybe a week away, then come back. And over and above that, when there are other students who we accommodate, who don't have anywhere to go during school holidays, we still give them a home here. So we are never like on a break or anything. It's a continuous process. Finally, a beautifully designed hostel in Ati River, Lukenya Studio Apartments. Let's see what they have. Kenya Studio Apartments, uh, we manage them for our current landlord. He purchased the properties around three years ago, and when he purchased them, he undertook a serious renovation, refurbishment, and now uh, furnishing of the apartments. Uh, ideally, we target students at Daystar University. The rent currently is 13500 per month, and this will encompass the rent, water, and also Wi-Fi. The units come semi-furnished. So ideally when you pay the rent and you move in, you get a bed, you get a mattress, curtains, and now the Wi-Fi and the water, and a TV set also. We currently have 20 units that are constructed, uh, 14 are occupied and 6 are vacant. Yeah. What makes us special? Uh, number one, it will be the location. We're just like uh, three minutes away from Daystar University. Number two, security. Uh, there's a police post that is just a few meters away. Number three, we have quality finishes. Uh, we strive to ensure that when you move into a property, you feel like you're home, despite being away from home. And also the last thing would be in terms of exclusivity, we only have 20 units, so we have uh, privacy for those who are actually living in the property. So they have a serene and peaceful environment if they decide to study or if they are dealing with work. looking to invest in this space. Student accommodation is largely dependent on their geography. It's also prudent to talk to students and understand their needs. For your real estate questions, First Avenue should be your number one port of call. Call on us and we'll guide you. Next, let's get inspired by an adventurous home ownership journey. Ah, Marion is a woman that, uh, that was born in the Netherlands. Um, I moved to Kenya in 89 to live here. I lived here for some, some years, got kids, got to know the country, really, really liked this place. And then in 2001, I founded Sarakasi and created my own home here for um, acrobats and dancers. 
Well, I've always been an adventurous person. I like to meet new places, go on holidays, meet new people. I was always interested in different cultures, and I've always been very interested in, in, in people. Uh, when I worked in the Netherlands, I also I, I worked with youth. I worked in a psychiatric hospital. I was a group counsellor, so I've always been very interested in what makes people tick and what makes people change. And um, I've always had a very open mind for, for cultures and people. So moving to Africa for me was a big adventure, and I really, really wanted to wanted to do that. It was not like a scary journey or something for me, even though my family at that time was like, oh, why are you going so far away? But of course I found out of pretty soon that it's just, you know, an airplane ride away. But um, anyway, I came to live here in Kenya and I really, really wanted to get to know the country and to get to know the people. Um, living as an expat in Kenya, it's very easy to live a very cushioned life, you know, within your own four walls and within your own community. But I chose to try at least to be different, just to, you know, to go out of my comfort zone and, um, and try to meet as many people and as many places as I could. And that's what I did the first year I was here. Sarakazi Dome is the house of Sarakazi Trust. And I'm the co-founder of Sarakazi Trust. And Sarakazi Trust was founded to give the performing arts a home and to facilitate training for dancers and acrobatics. We started with acrobatics and after a few years we also started uh, a dance training. So the training we do here is, uh, like I said, technical acrobats and dance training, but we also give our artists life skill training because we want to give them skills to become like more responsible citizens and, and, and rooted people who can take charge of their own career and of their own life. Um, and this place, this Sarakazi Dome, has become a home to, uh, to many acrobats and many dancers. The way Sarakazi Trust is run is that we create ownership for the people who come here because they really take part in, you know, not only the training but, but the programs that we run here. Well, the Sarakazi artists are very, very all-round, so we do a lot of events, we do a lot of corporate events, so the corporate world, of course, would then be our target. But here at the Sarakazi Dome, we have our own cultural agenda, so we also have our own uh, platforms. So we had a hip-hop platform, for example, called the Hip Hop Hoop Hook Up, and for that we target now the hip-hop youth from the, from the areas in and around Nairobi. But we also have our own marketing performances and our own dance and circus performances, which is for the general public. We have been doing the Sawa Sawa Festival for many years, which was also for the general public. That festival has been held here at the Dome, but also at the Carnivore, it has been held at Kassarani. So different venues, different, different target audiences. Um, and when it comes to the, the, the jobs that we find for our artists, that can be like anywhere. So like I just said, it can be corporate gigs, but it can also be in an embassy, it can be for a video clip, it can be a launch of a product. They go to different media houses. So, uh, but mainly, of course, Sarakazi is here for the youth because it's a youth empowerment trust. Um, but, like I said, through our arts and through our performances, we reach out to a very, very wide audience. The first years I lived in Kenya, I think I moved like every two years to another house. Um, so you really get used to pack up and move and pack up and move and pack up and move. And in the time I lived in Kenya, I also moved to the, to the States for like one and a half years and, and then came back. So I really got used to, you know, to packing up my stuff and move. But what I did all over the years, I always managed to keep stuff that is very close to my heart, like certain family things like lights or a bed or a chair, things that I was really attached to that really reminded me of home. Those are things that always moved with me. But along the journey, you also start collecting stuff that, of course, that is Kenyan or African or... or even when I lived in the States, there's like artifacts and things that you, that you like to, that you get attached to and that remind you of certain episodes of your life or people have given it to you and there's a very emotional value. So those things I've always uh, carried around. Um, living in Kenya, I've always liked it because coming from the Netherlands where it can be very rainy and very cold and then moving to Kenya where the weather for us is always like sunny and nice and, and that of course also makes that you live in, in different circumstances. Like in the Netherlands, you know, your windows are closed and your heater is always on in the winter time. But here you can have a very vibrant outdoor life and that of course is um, that I really like houses with big verandas. You can sit outside, there's, you know, big, big compounds 
even walking on the streets, it's very, very different than, than what I was used to and where I come from. But now I've, I've, I've already lived in Kenya since 89, so I lived longer here than I lived back in the Netherlands, so now I'm like, you know, this is my point of reference now, and I really like living here. So in terms of home ownership, yes, we've bought a home, so we've, we are like homeowners. And that is, of course, that gives you stability and it makes you feel at home where you stay. So for me, Kenya is home. I'm sure many of you ask how you too can inspire the next homeowner. Just call on us and I'll be at your doorstep. The East Africa Property Investment Summit is here with us again. This summit provides in-depth analysis of the property market plus investment opportunities across the region. Book your seat today. meeting at Bandari Apartments Phase 3 grounds for their open day. They are selling off plan. Come and secure your unit. Are you hosting an event groundbreaking your project or product launches? On this platform, you're sure to reach your target market book a date with us. We've come to the end of today's show. Thank you for watching. Let's meet again next Sunday as we discover ideal getaways for this Easter season. This conversation continues on our social media platforms. Engage with us and get insights on emerging trends. Remember, there is something for everyone. Koheri!